We're filming in Scottsdale, Arizona at the Paradise Valley Jazz Party. My name is Monk Rowe, and I'm very, very pleased to have Sir Roland Hanna here as my guest. It's my pleasure, Monk. Well, Thank you for inviting me. Congratulations on this uh, honor you've got here. Being oh, that's, that's really something. I never thought that, um, that I'd be the guy they'd be honoring. Mm. You know, because I always figure, hey, I'm too young for that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we were just talking about tributes, you know. Like, yeah. Be careful who you pay tribute to. Yeah, yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. You just were saying some very well thought out phrases about different piano players, and I have to say, it sounded to me like you were describing yourself. No, no, <laughs> no not, not me. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'll tell you, um, I, I've worked hard at the piano. I've been working uh, almost all my life trying to play the piano. And um, just when you think you're, you're getting there, you're, you're getting to a place where you can do whatever you want to do, something happens that, that usually you have no control over. And for the last uh, 10, 12 years, I haven't been able to practice. I'm, I'm going to start back, but I haven't been able to practice. Uh, I've, been, I've been working hard, uh, and I'm teaching a lot. Yes. And there's no time for, for me to sit as I used to. I used to, uh, like, for instance, if I were going to go and play a gig, uh, say, say, California or Japan, I used to sit and practice Chopin etudes and play Bach and, and just run through my Mozart or play a, a Beethoven sonata maybe two or three times and get my chops up, you know, mm -hmm. get my head up, you know. And the reason I practice the classical music is because there's so many nuances and differences and, and changes to go through, you know, different minds coming together with music. And whenever I would play, uh, I had control over the piano rather than the piano having control over me. <laughs> mm -hmm. But now I don't get the chance to practice. Boy, it's like you've got 5,000 pounds on your back. <laughs> no you know? kidding. I mean, I still yeah. want to do the same ideas and the yeah. ideas I do, but they don't all come out. You know? Right. That's why I was talking about those guys like uh -huh. Monty Alexander and, and, uh, and uh, what's his name? Petrucciani. Yeah. And, and there's, there's another one, too, another young fellow um, who was a student of mine. Uh, oh, boy, names start to slip yeah. away. But he was, he's a wonderful player. I, I explained to him years ago, can't even think of how long ago it was, but it was more than 20 years ago. I said, uh, uh, if you really want to get a control and command, Play some Scriabin, play some Foray, play some Rachmaninoff, play some Chopin. Spend, spend time practicing Chopin. They knew what the piano was about. And I, I told him just like that, and he took me to heart. Mm. And the next thing I know, he had a beautiful album out. Foray, Chopin, Rachmaninoff. Ooh. Wow, he turned. <laughs> yeah, it was great, too, to hear that. You know, yeah. he, took, he took the chords and, and uh, form and shape of the pieces. Mm -hmm. And he and he paid tribute to these guys, you know. I thought it was wonderful. Yeah. Isn't it curious that a lot <clears throat> of classical musicians are um, enamored sometimes of what a jazz player can do? Mm -hmm. At the same time, a jazz musician looks at what they do and. Yeah. Well, you know, it it it, it always seemed to me that the uh, the guys who really are the the giants are the, the composers who recognize how important it is to improvise. You know, Rachmaninoff was a great improviser. Uh, uh, Anton Rubinstein was a great improviser. Uh, Busoni, Tausig, they were great improvisers. They could sit down and improvise on a Bach fugue. And, you know, it's uh, anybody who plays mm -hmm. the fugues, they know what I'm talking about. They know how difficult it is to do that. Uh, but they were also people who analyzed constantly. They were never people who just played notes. And that's the unfortunate thing that sometimes uh, young students don't get the understanding that you have to 
know the form, mm -hmm. the shape, the, the harmonies, and you have to go beyond uh, triad harmonies. See, some classical people never go beyond triadic harmonies. Uh, when they when they do begin to understand that there's more than just passing tones and upper neighbors, well then they start to you know make really good music. Yeah. So when you play Mozart or Beethoven, mm -hmm. you're most likely recognizing the harmonies as they go by. Yes, all the all the variations and nuances mm -hmm. that are put in. Like for instance, <clears throat> in uh, in the uh, Appassionata, the last movement, uh, uh, Beethoven is using the diminished chord over a pedal point. You know, well uh, that. That flatted ninth that we call today in jazz, that Beethoven may not have called it a flatted ninth, mm -hmm. but he certainly heard it the same way we're hearing it yeah. now. You know, uh, and there, there are certain things that happen in in Mozart. Mozart also was a guy who loved to make flatted ninths, but he would move them right away. You know, mm -hmm. see, they were afraid of um, society, more afraid of society uh -huh. than we are today. Uh, they were afraid of um, overlords, uh, people who would come and stop them from playing music if, mm. if they did music a certain way. Uh, look at Haydn, Franz Joseph Haydn, uh, the, the Farewell Symphony. Yes. You know, there's an example of right. how afraid they were right. of people, you know. He couldn't come out and say yeah. what he wanted to. Yeah, he, he to. couldn't come out and say, look, you've got to take care of these guys, you know. You can't yeah. just have us play all the time like that and don't take care of us. And one by one, they just <laughs> sneak away. <laughs> I mean, I, I can imagine that happening. <laughs> There's a funny story, and, I, and I, hope, I hope it doesn't hurt anybody's feeling. But once I was working with Lionel Hampton. We had uh, taken a gig with him at Rodney Dangerfield's place in New York. I had a group called the New York Jazz Quartet mm -hmm. at that time. And uh, Hamp loved it. And I loved him. I always have loved him, you know. But uh, whenever we'd play together, he would play. He'd never stop playing. He would never stop playing. So finally one day, I, I said to Frank, I said, Frank, I don't want to hurt his feelings, but how, how can we get him to, to know when the time is up? How can we get him to know that, hey, we've played an hour and a half, and he wants to go on another hour and a half. We've got to take a break, you know? <laughs> Frank said, leave it to me. I'll oh, take no. care of it. <laughs> I can almost. <laughs> and so we're playing this tune, and he's just wailing away. And, and Frank just sort of gave me a signal. Stop playing. I, I stopped. And George was still playing. George was still playing. And Grady was still wailing away. And Frank gave George a signal, and George stopped. <laughs> and, and Grady was still playing. And Frank was still, Frank was playing too behind him. And, gra and gradually, Frank stopped, you know, Frank stopped, and, and Hampus and Grady stopped, and we all walked off and left him. <laughs> of course, the people thought that it was all part of the act. Right. <laughs> huh. That's funny. Yeah. He got out, did he get out of it gracefully? I oh, mean, yeah, he, he finally, he was, uh, no, he was, he, he understood, he laughed with us, you know, it was a big laugh. Yeah. You know, but I, I never I never wanted to hurt his feelings. Yes. You know. Well, I don't think so. he's changed from no, what I hear. No, he's <laughs> still, you know. Even at this age, yes. when he starts to play, he still, he, he just loves to play. You yeah. know, I think that's great. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you have to recognize that you've got <laughs> other guys there, too. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, well. well, you had a certainly, uh, your childhood must have had diverse musical influences. Your, your father was a, a, he a played preacher. Saxophone. And, and he, he played preacher saxophone. Well. Yeah, he played saxophone. And, and was, um, was there church influence in in the musical end of things for you? I think so. I, yeah. I, I, I never went into the church and played piano in the church. Mm -hmm. that, that never happened. But um, my father loved to play the saxophone. And so that certainly had to have some effect on mm -hmm. me. Although he died when I was seven years old. Mm. But um, my my sister played, my mother played, my, uh, my I had a brother who played the trumpet and the violin, and I had a bro another brother who played the saxophone, and, and uh, one who sang, actually two who sang. The, the oldest one sang, but 
singing was never a, a major thing with him. He became a doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and the one next to me loved to sing. He used to like Lord Melchior. You know, I don't know if you know that name. Lord Melchior was a great tenor. Oh. And he used to come on every Sunday, and, and Lagos would sing oh. with him, you know. Uh -huh. But uh, my situation was a little bit different. Uh, the piano was for my sister and my mother, not for me. And um, I used to bang on it. I was about three years old, I used to bang on it. And I kept banging on it. And I kept banging on it. And finally, they took it, put it out in the barn. <laughs> Oh, gee. I, was, I thought you were going to say, finally, they got me some lessons. No, 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 no. no. It, they said, you want to bang on it? Bang on it out in the barn, you know? And I did. And winter and spring and summer and fall, I'd go out there. But I used to, I got so good, I used to cut the fingers off my gloves in the wintertime and put my coat around my neck and go out and Play, practice that piano, you know. I get some hours in some wow. days, you know, until I got, you know, old enough and yeah. started. It's, it seemed like I was going to be serious about it. I was about 10 or 11 years old. And then she says, okay, you can get a piano. <laughs> <laughs> but I had to go through a lot to get a, you know, uh -huh. a, a piano. When I was uh, about 11 or 12, uh, uh, I met Tommy Flanagan in high school. And uh, Tommy was the first, he was really the first guy to open my eyes to jazz. I had heard jazz, but I didn't care too much for, for it up until about 11 years old. Mm -hmm. And when I heard Tommy play, I went right up to him and I said, what, what kind of music are you playing? You don't have any music in front of you. What are you, what are you doing, you know? <laughs> he said, don't you know about Charlie Parker? Don't you know about, I said, Bud Powell? Who is Bud Powell, you know? Finally, he, because I would sit, after he'd play, I'd sit right down and play a, a Chopin etude. Mm -hmm. And he'd say, I, you got all this from this music, you know? So uh, we just exchanged ideas, and, and it was Tommy who influenced me, really, to play jazz, you know? I said, hey, this, you know the changes to the blues, you know? <laughs> <laughs> we were yeah. at Northern High School. It was a long time ago. I hate to think of yeah. how long ago it was, you know? But... Uh, no, the, the church, although it had uh, an influence, it didn't have a direct influence, uh -huh. you know. Um, wasn't until I was a grown man that I began to use elements of gospel music and, you know, actually mm -hmm. uh, put it in the music. You know? yeah. yeah. Did you have aspirations to become a professional classical pianist? Yes. And at some point, I did. Um, when I was uh, 16 years old, I made a promise to myself to become a concert pianist. I uh, didn't know that I was going to go to the Korean War. Oh. <laughs> didn't know I was going to get in the Army and, uh -huh. you know. It's, that kind of changed things, you know. Yeah. And then when I came out of the Army, I went to Juilliard, you know. And uh, the time that I spent into Juilliard, uh, let me know that it wasn't uh, the music of Chopin and Brahms and Beethoven that I had to play. It was the music of my people. I had to play Duke Ellington and, and uh, Fats Waller and, uh, you know, Fletcher Henderson. These are my people, just as Rubenstein was playing the music of his people, Chopin, uh -huh. you know, just as Horowitz plays the music of his people, uh, Scriabin and Rachmaninoff. I had to play the music of my people, you see. And I think uh, it's not so much that, that you're forced to do that, but it's incumbent upon you. you, you it, it, you're born into a certain situation. And you have to learn to accept that and to do something with that. Because uh, world culture can only become a blend if people accept it and understand it, you know. When people try to deny their particular culture, well, then what they do is they eliminate something. They li eliminate something of humanity. But when people recognize the individual uh, culture of their people, where they come from, then they 
contribute to world humanity, you know? That's so much more important to me than nationalism or, mm. or just, you know, uh, this thing belongs here. No, we're, we're, we're on a planet. We're on a place where everybody is involved. And you know, we, that's the, the thing that's beautiful about it is that there's so many differences and we all have to contribute to it. Mm -hmm. you know? And so that, that was like uh, an awakening to me, you mm. know. Uh, I, I like to call it an epiphany because, uh, you know, when I was young, nobody ever talked to me about that kind of stuff. You know? uh -huh. And then I became aware of, of all of these great people, you know. I mean, Willie the Lion Smith was a great pianist. Lucky Roberts was a great pianist. Uh, Scott Joplin was a great composer. Uh, Jelly Roll Morton was a great composer. You know, these people, they, they meant something. And all of that now, a hundred years later, is meaning something to every meaning something to everybody in the United mm. States. Uh, young people who don't get that information, you know, it may take them till they're 65 or yeah. 70 years old uh -huh. to understand where they come from. Wow. But I was lucky to get that, you know, before I was 30 years old, and to know that this is the direction I have to go in, and not so much uh, playing Chopin etudes, yeah. even though I use all of that all the time. Right. Was it you a know. gradual realization for you? I, I think it was a kind of a, uh, I, I can't say it was gradual because after I came out of the army, it seemed to me that that's what I had to do. Uh, and, and when I went to Juilliard, I concentrated on developing the piano skills mm -hmm. for that reason. Not necessarily to play concert, although uh, at the age of 16, I said, that's what I want to do. I want to be the concert yeah. pianist. But you know, coming out of Juilliard, I said, well, if I am, if I am going to be a concert pianist, it's going to be in a different way, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's certainly going to be yeah. playing uh, right. Daydreams or uh -huh. Lush Life or yeah. something like that. In concert. Yeah, yeah, that would right. be it. You know, you know I, one, of my, one of my mentors was Art Tatum, and he was truly a concert pianist. Um, Whenever he played, no matter what he played, it was like a concert piece. And um, uh, Horowitz, um, uh, the violinist, I can't. Anyway, three famous concert musicians went in to hear him play one night. And they came away saying, if this man had uh, wanted to be a classical pianist, he probably would have been the greatest classical pianist who ever lived. Mm -hmm. Because he would make up all yeah. that music yeah. on the spot, it's you know, it? just in, and it's still, this is like 45, almost 50 years after his death, there still hasn't been anybody else to do that, yeah. you know. So uh, he was sort of a mentor to uh -huh. me, you know. I said to myself, I want to be able to do something like that, yeah. you know. And uh, I've been uh, at, um, at Aaron Copeland School of Music, I've been training people to do just that. You know, I have a young fellow by the name of uh, Jeb Patton who is going to be in that same vein. He's a wonderful player. Wow. You know, plays with the Heath brothers. You've probably seen him. Okay. And uh, haven't, haven't noticed, but he's in that same vein. Were yeah. you sent overseas uh, for the Korean War? Uh, I went to Alaska and I went to Hawaii. I played uh, Rhapsody in Blue in Hawaii. And uh, in, up in Alaska, we didn't do very much of anything. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But I was in, in um, Fort Lewis, Seattle, okay. you know, mostly. I played for uh, generals and captains and yeah. <laughs> that kind of stuff, okay. you know. No, I didn't go to Korea, but I played off a lot of guys. Uh, when, I was in yeah. the, when I was in the war, uh, uh, I used to play cello. And uh, I would go, it, instead of playing cymbals, which is what they had me doing in the band, I would take my cello out and we'd go to the boat and I'd have to be there so I'd take my cello and I'd play the guys and they'd look down and say, playing the cello down there. <laughs> <laughs> I played Pepper off. Who else did I play off? I played, uh, played a number of guys off. Yeah. You, know? They, you know, I was part of the band so <laughs> we had to do it, you know. Well, <laughs> well after this change of, uh, of career perhaps, you proceeded in 
a short number of years to play with a really wide variety of people, mm. from, uh, from from Benny Goodman to Charles Mingus. Oh yeah. In, in the space of about mm -hmm. a year. Yeah. As a matter of fact, the same time during the same oh, time. Oh okay. Uh, Benny Goodman came about as a result of you know, I think. Teddy Wilson or somebody said no, he was supposed to do the Brussels World's Fair oh. or do a tour in Europe. And somebody that he would normally call canceled and said no. And so he uh, uh, had the idea to call Juilliard and oh. see if he could get some young person. And it just so happened that I was there at the time. And um, uh, one of the teachers, uh, the dance instructor, was a friend of Benny's, as she was a friend of Muriel Zuckerman. And uh, she, I used to play dance classes, because I was always improvising. And she recommended me. So I went up to <laughs> Benny Goodman's house, and it's a funny little story goes with this. Uh, he lived on 66th Street, uh, just past 2nd Avenue. And uh, I got to his apartment, and I was just so nervous. The guy at the door said, uh, can I help you? I was so nervous. I said, yes, uh, I'd like to see Mr. Tommy Dorsey, please. <laughs> and the guy, you said, really? the guy said, you mean Benny Goodman, don't you? <laughs> I was just so nervous. Oh, that's funny. One but I never told Benny that. <laughs> one of those damn things. No, that's a good thing, I think. <laughs> but anyway, I, I went up and... and uh, and played for him. You uh -huh. know, he asked me to play a couple of tunes. I played uh, Love for Sale and something else. Some, something, I think, Yesterday's. And uh, he said, okay, uh, you, you'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then, then we had rehearsals, you know. I met Arvel Shaw and, and um, Roy Burns. And we went up to Stanford, Connecticut, and rehearsed up there. And then um, uh, I did the tour. I, I think I had to get permission from the school mm -hmm. to take, take off and do the tour because uh, although I wasn't graduating, uh, it would have a, 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 some reflection on my grades. Uh -huh. So I told Benny, I said, Benny, I'm, I'm not sure they're gonna let me do this, you know. So he called the school, no problem, Mr. Goodman, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, he called from Europe after we were there, they, they extended the tour. And he called from Europe, said uh, he, he won't be back for his exams. Can you give him his exams in June? Now, school ended in May. Yeah. And they said, Mr. Goodman, no problem. You know, it's just a, you know, he could do whatever he wanted to uh -huh. do. <laughs> you know, wow. It didn't matter. You know? I got back, they gave me the exams, Good. no problem. You know? No, uh, and, and soon after that, this was in 1958, soon after that, I had met Mingus before in 1957 up at some sort of uh, uh, camp. We were playing summer festival and Mingus came up and sat in. And uh, after I got back from Brussels, Mingus asked, uh, called me and asked me if I'd come and work some gig with him. So it was the same year, uh -huh. 58, 59. And I was still off and on with Benny until he uh, uh, he hired me for on a regular basis. Uh, and then around 1960, March or February or March, Sarah Vaughan called, you know. Uh, her bass player, Richard Davis, had recommended me to her and I went out with her. And that, oh. was, that was fantastic. Oh, that bad. was the greatest experience I ever had musically. Uh, up to that time. Yeah. I learned more with Sarah Vaughan than I did in all the five years at Juilliard, <laughs> you know. But she was just, uh, you know, she had amassed so much information in her singing. And by playing for her and, and hearing chords and, you know, the way she could, she passed that right on to me. Just taught me the, the kind of art of listening to harmonies, oh. you know. She could hear, she could sing in one note, exactly what harmony I was supposed to play. Ooh. Yeah, she was, she was a scary lady. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, she, I'll give you an example of how scary she was. We were at Berlin, opposite um, Count Basie's band. Uh, <clears throat> she 
<clears throat> she got worked up one night, and she just sat next to each uh, horn player in the in the uh, reed section and sang their parts to one of the pieces. Each one, she just moved from one to the other and sang their part. That's how great she was. Wow. You know, I don't know anybody who could do that. Mm -hmm. You know, but she just sang, just sang that while they're playing. She was singing right next to them. You know, and I was following her, listening, just amazed at that. Uh, you know, this that, that lady was a genius. Uh -huh. you know? She was born genius. <clears throat> Excuse me. We played once uh, a recording session for Billy May, and she sang the Green Hills of Summer. And they went over it 19 times. Each time she sang it, she sang it impeccably differently. Now I was I was in the I was in the session. And just you know that's. You know, that's what I mean. That's how great she was. She, mm -hmm. And each one, I, I, I think that's probably why they never put the record out, because whoever had to listen to it couldn't decide which uh, take was the best yeah. take. Or, you know, <laughs> she sang it 19 times, not because anything was bad, but uh -huh. they wanted to see if they could get more. Wow. She was amazing, really. Yeah. Each one of these people, from Goodman to Mingus, and I guess Sarah had a reputation as being a taskmaster. They were. were was, uh, was it a positive experience for most of it for you? I think so. I, you know, to answer that question, I have to go back and, and remember my relationship with Benny. Benny, Benny was a great clarinetist. He could play any music classical or jazz, but he had some restrictions on himself. You know, he wouldn't allow his jazz to be as free as it could have been. Uh, he was limited to the chord changes that had been played. He was, he was not open to fresh chord changes. If you tried to do anything a little different, he'd say, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, and, and he used to ask me to come up to the house just to play and play and play so that he could try to open that door. But whenever we'd get to a song like Again, you know, uh, 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 what is it, a uh, simple song, and I'd throw in a few little, I said, what, what's, what's that chord you just played? What, what's that? You know, he'd, he'd ask me, you know, and I'd say, well, it's just an F7 going to the B-flat minor. He'd say, well, well, don't play that. Isn't that, isn't that supposed to be C minor? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no kidding. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? Yeah. He, he, couldn't, he couldn't adjust to, to things like that. And, uh, and, and Mingus, on the other hand, was a taskmaster in, in terms of getting guys to play a certain way for him. You know, he... Now, he, he didn't have that kind of schooling where he could tell what uh, was supposed to be played. That's why he kept practicing the piano. He was still trying to get, oh. get his harmony chops. And he used to call me late at night and ask me how to play a certain bridge or, or whatever. But the saxophone players that, uh, that he had, he used to give them a hard time. He'd tell them, no, you've got to play the New Orleans type, type uh, jazz. You've got to do this and you've got to do that. Oh. You know. Uh, was there a lot of uh, singing of parts to you? Yes. You had to like try to yes. get them that yes. way. Mingus would sing out parts. He'd yeah. sing out the things he'd want. Mm -hmm. uh, he would, uh, it, it wasn't until later that he started to work with Cy Johnson. He was working with Jimmy Nepper first, mm -hmm. you know, and Jimmy Nepper used to help him to write out his parts. Uh, and then later when he got uh, older, and he couldn't really write anymore. He started to get that disease. He got Cy Johnson to help him. Uh -huh. But uh, when Nepper was working with him, he'd sing things to Nepper, and Nepper would write them down, and then they'd put, him, put it together. And he used to do that to me if he wanted a certain chord. He'd sing a certain thing and try to play the bass note, and then I would give him the chord and tell him what it was, you know, because he didn't know. You know, as great as he was, mm -hmm. sometimes he didn't know the chord. Uh, Mingus had played with 
uh, Art Tatum, had played with Duke Ellington, had played with a, a great many pianists. But the actual uh, harmony, he didn't always know, you know. And um, we'd sit down and talk a lot about, about uh, academic harmony, you know. Um, uh, what he did know was how to play the bass. He was a phenomenal bass player. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you can't take anything away from Mingus in terms of that bass. Uh, but he, he didn't have much stamina for steady, steady, steady tempo. Oh. And I think that's one of the reasons why he, re you know, uh, did something new in jazz, giving jazz this um, uh, shift of rhythm and shift uh -huh. of, of time, you know. Uh, starting out with one kind of time and then without a conductor changing it suddenly, you know. And, and it was a good thing that he had Danny Richmond with him, Richmond with him for so long because Danny was with him like, you know, they, would, they were like yeah. on water skis going together, you know. Oh. Shift, well. shift the time just like that, yeah. you know. Yeah. Wow. But uh, with Sarah, <clears throat> there was another, uh, a different um, situation. She loved to rehearse. She didn't like to sing at the rehearsals, but she loved to rehearse. Where, wherever we played, when we got there, we usually rehearsed three or four hours, and it would be some new tunes, uh, you know, some new, and she would give me ideas as to how to, to uh, set up the arrangement. They, the, the scary, uh, time that I had with Sarah was when we played uh, Harrah's in Reno, Nevada. Uh, this was like the first gig where we had a band, you know. And she didn't tell me that I'm supposed to write all the arrangements for the no. band. <laughs> so when we get there, <laughs> oh wow, you know, suddenly the guys say, "Where, where are the arrangements? Where are the parts?" I had to sit up like the whole weekend and write arrangements, you know. It's, this this was a kind of taskmaster she was. <laughs> she look, it's your gig. You you you're my musical director. It's your gig. Get my charts. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Did you did you get a chance to hear them be, before the gig? You know. Well, at least I I got a chance. Bobby Bryant, trumpet player, wonderful uh -huh. trumpet player. He was on the gig and he helped me a great deal. I, I managed to write about six charts, and he mm -hmm. wrote about three or four more. And uh, uh, when I got hung up writing them, I had the, you, you probably know Jerry Wiggins. Yes. Pianist, wonderful yep. pianist. He let me have his apartment to do the writing, you know? And then he came and helped me by, by uh, doing some copying for me. Oh. But I, you know, those guys, I, I never forget them because they were great at a time when I knew nothing. You know? <laughs> what size band was that? That was, uh, let's see, three sax, four saxes, uh -huh. one trombone player, and two trumpets. You know, it was, uh, you know, it was a small band, you yeah. know, small band, 12-piece band probably. Yeah. Uh, rhythm section, uh, me, Richard Davis, and Percy Bryce, and, um, and then uh, nine other guys. You know? yeah. We had no guitar. But, uh, you know, you ha they had to be a, a nice band, you know, so. Time with Sarah was um, early 1960s. 19, early 1960, 1961, 1962. Yeah. Um, I left sometime in 1963. Did uh, you ever have any hassles in um, different parts of the country traveling with that? particular group? No. Not with Sarah. Mm -hmm. With Al Hibbler. With Al Hibbler. Um, uh, but right after Sarah, right after I left Sarah, and, and that, that was a, uh, not a very good way to leave anybody, uh, Sarah had a husband at that time. His name was C.B. Atkins. And he um, left us stranded. Mm. Didn't pay us the last week in uh, the hotel in Las Vegas, and didn't didn't get an airplane ticket for us to get out of there, so they just left. <clears throat> well, of course we stayed, and we called the union back in New York, 
And Cy, uh, uh, High Jaffe was the uh, treasurer at that time. And uh, he called Sarah's house and he told CB, if he didn't get a ticket out to Las Vegas immediately, this was like just the same weekend, if he didn't get a ticket out to Las Vegas, Sarah would never work in the United States again. We, we got a call from Western Union that same night. Said our plane tickets, the money and the, everything is, is uh, here at the Western Union. You, your tickets are here. So uh, High Jaffe was, was serious. He was powerful, wow. you know. Wow. And he probably could have stopped her from working just like that, you know, because they didn't, they, they didn't take any stuff from anybody. That's, that's why uh, the union was powerful at that time. Now, this is like 1963. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, now, now people do everything they want to do, you know, right. anything. There's, there is no power. But see, that, that's, times have changed so much, and nobody has even noticed it, you know. Uh, uh, you just, it wasn't that they were, were overlords or anything like that. It was that they looked out for the musicians. By the same token, the musicians had to take care of themselves, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sarah was part of the union. She was a pianist, you know. Oh, yeah. I, you probably know that she got her start working with Earl Hines. And, right. And uh, Billy Eckstein playing piano in mm -hmm. Earl Hines' band. So, you know, they, they wouldn't stand for her, for her husband or manager mistreating the musicians. So we had tickets that night. Wow. <laughs> you know? uh, but anyway, <clears throat> to answer your question, I worked with... Carmen McRae right after that and went back to some of the same places that I played with Sarah. That was a good experience. But then I, when I, uh, when the, that ran dry, I went to work with Al Hibbler. And Al Hibbler and I were in, in, um, sorry, <laughs> were in um, Miami, Florida, playing at a, um, a hotel, bar type place that had a restaurant. This was in 1965. Mm -hmm. And um, we, as a matter of fact, this was the same year I met Monty Alexander. Uh, Monty came in that same night, played with us. I told him, I said, look, this is my number. You come up to New York. I'll, I'll get you some work. You, you play too good to be down here, man. Come up to New York. He was 18 years old, I think. And he came up. Anyway, after we got through with the gig, Al wanted to get something to eat. Well, we were in the bar, and the restaurant was right next door. You go out of the bar, and you go right into the restaurant. And we were staying in the same motel. You know, we get into the restaurant. Just I lead Al into the door, and instead of walking all the way in, we sat right there by the door. The stools were kind of high for me. You know, well, it wasn't uh -huh. too high for Al. It was <laughs> <high> for <laughs> <Yeah>. me. <laughs> so I kind of ambled my way up there. And, and we're sitting there for a while, and nobody shows up. Finally, I said, uh, waitress, waitress. And she came over, and she says, uh, we don't serve the colored. Just like that. It caught me off guard completely because we've been playing all night long, you know. And no sooner than she said, we don't serve the colored, here comes two great big cops in the door. They walked right in. Says, you having trouble here, Annie? <laughs> and Al, Al said, oh, Roland, let's, let's go. <laughs> you know, we got off and went right back into the, into the bar where we were, you know. It was a, kind of a close call because I, I was a hothead oh. in those days. I was a young nut, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, like I said, these two great big guys were as tall as the lamps. <laughs> <laughs> They could have swiped me out with one, yeah. one blow, yeah. you know. But I had uh, kind of a hot temper in those days. Mm -hmm. That was, you know, yeah. you know how we are. <laughs> <laughs> well, those were active days, too, yes. in, in civil yes. rights, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, there was a lot going on in those yeah. days, you know. And Hibbler was, uh, Hibbler took part in all, some of that, uh -huh. all that walking. And I never did. I didn't take any part in, to, in any of that except to give lip service. Mm -hmm. um, but I think those people did a fantastic job to, yeah. to, to lay their lives on the line, you know, to get people to recognize that, hey, 
the Civil War is over, 100 years, you know? Forget about that stuff, you know? Right. I don't know if, if they'll ever forget it, you know? I hope. Yeah. 1970, uh, well, tell me about your, your knighthood. Oh, it's, that was a, a great experience for me. Uh, in 1969, I had been with the Thad Jones Band for about two and a half, not quite three years, because Hank, Hank uh, started with him, even though uh, Thad and I talked about my being part of the band before he hired Hank. He, when he finally did it, he hired Hank. Well, Hank was busy with the television and, and couldn't do it all the time, so he, every time he couldn't do it, he'd call me and say, Roland, would you take over for me? And of course, I, I took over. And finally, in, um, sometime in 66, uh, I, you know, I had a lot of students. I told Hank, uh, I, I have to, I'm busy, I'm, I got students. So if, if you can't do this gig, let me know so I can arrange to do it every Monday, you know. So Hank said, okay, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> and I started working with the band. And this association with the band, uh, it sort of branched out. A lot of people began to hear me play. And uh, one night in my studio on 73rd Street in Manhattan, somebody called and asked me if I would uh, consider coming to Liberia to play uh, concerts. And of course I said yes immediately. Uh, there was no money involved. No, they, they had no money to pay, but they needed uh, some people to play. And it turned out that they were asking people from various countries to contribute, you know, their art mm -hmm. uh, in the concert situation so they could raise money to build a, a, a school I see. Uh, in Monrovia. And I, I was uh, Jim, Jimmy Randolph, or James Cheatham. I don't know if you know that name, but he was an actor in Guys and Dolls on Broadway. He's a singer. And we went together. We met several people from Turkey, people from Germany, people from France, acrobats from uh, uh, Italy, who did, you know, uh, uh, live wire. So it was, it was not a circus, but they, had, they put on a show, and we were part of the show. We would perform songs uh, from Randolph's um, Guys and Dolls, and then we'd sing pop tunes or whatever. Mm -hmm. And we, we went there for one week, and the, the thing was so successful, they kept us for another week. So we stayed in, in Liberia and and moved from Liberia to Senegal to um, Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, we went to uh, Guinea-Bissau. We went to several countries close by. Liberia is only about 85 miles deep, mm -hmm. about the size of New Jersey. And uh, we went to several countries around and did performances. And they apparently raised enough or quite a bit of money uh, every other night they would have a big party at the, at the, uh, the uh, Secretary of State's house. Uh, uh, Grimes was his name. His wife would put on a big spread, and food I'd never seen or yeah. tasted before. And <clears throat> so uh, when, we, when, the, when the second week was over, we were invited to uh, the President's house in Monrovia. Had a huge castle. And, uh, he had, he had those 24-foot ceilings, you know, marble all over the floor. And it was just gorgeous. And he had uh, myself and Jimmy uh, Cheatham to come there. And he asked us if we would, he said, since we can't give you money, would you accept knighthood? Well, of course I said yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how, that's how that happened. And when I came back, home, we got a telegram uh, uh, for me to come down to Washington, D.C. to the consulate, uh, Liberian consulate, and bring my family. And I went down, 
and kneeled and they dubbed me sir, you know, night commander, you know, that's uh -huh. what it is. Uh, and that, that experience, it gave me a great big huge emblem that was around my neck and somehow that disappeared. Oh. I didn't lose it. I think somebody just took it. You know, oh. it had a great big, uh, uh, you know, emblem on it and colors, you know, the colors of the Liberian flag. And uh, I, I don't know where that is now. Yeah. But uh, the, uh, the plaque, I have that. You know, my wife hangs that yeah. on the wall. You know. But I'm very proud of that because uh, it, it means so much more than money. Mm -hmm. you know, the money would have been spent that week. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> you know, but this has lasted for 30 years, 31 yeah. years, you know. Oh. <clears throat> so that's how that happened. You know. Did the um, citizens of those countries respond to yes. what you played? Yes, the the people would come, and most and most of the time they were young people. They were children between the ages of eight and seventeen or sixteen. You know, they would respond. Yes, and sometimes they'd come up and try to talk talk to us and ask us, you know, how did we learn or how long have you been playing or questions uh -huh. like that, you know. Yeah. Oh, yes, they responded. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Randolph, I don't know where he is now, but he was quite a, uh, an open singer, open person. And he had a tremendous personality. Being, a, being an actor, he would, they would gravitate to him. Uh, and the overflow would come and ask me a, a few questions, you know. Uh -huh. Because I'm the accompanist, you know, in that case. But uh, he, I think he handled everything very well. They really liked him. Really, he was sort of like uh, uh, a, a a Paul Robeson type mm -hmm. person, you know, just big voice, great big smile, happy man, you know, big. He was he, uh, Jimmy's a tall guy. He wasn't. He's he's about six feet two, three, mm -hmm. something like that. So. Uh, he had a, you know, the persona involved, yeah. there, you know, and uh, it it seemed to me that the my experience in Africa gave me something that I hadn't had before, and that was a a look at people who, although they were poor financially, they were rich in spirit and in the fact that they have a home. And it's the kind of spirit that, when I got to America, I didn't see that. It wasn't, it wasn't there, you know? That happiness, that glow, that, that feeling of belonging, didn't see that in America, mm -hmm. you know? You're, you're, you're a young man. Uh, in those days, um, people would sometimes be loaded down with drugs in the corners of Harlem, you sometimes see people who were just literally wiped out and had a defeated attitude. Uh, I suppose you could see the same thing now, except that there, most of most of those young men have been put in jail for one reason or another. You know, uh, one fourth of the black population yeah. is sitting up in <coughs> in jailhouses. You know, so you know the the changes that have come. Uh -huh. have uh, not all been good, and they haven't all been bad. It's just a balance, you know. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I don't say that I would, I would uh, trade living in America for living in Africa, and then again, maybe I would. Uh, mm -hmm. Who knows, you know. It, yeah. it might be a wonderful thing to live in Africa for a time, yeah. you know. Well, it's such a huge continent, too. I mean, I'm sure yeah. it changes from one country to the next. Yes, it does. Yeah. It does. And, and it's like having 50 or 60 or 75 different countries yeah. in one place. Although you know you're in Africa, and you know that you can go from, from Dahomey to, uh, to Ivory Coast to Guinea to some other place, thinking that, you, you know, it's like going from one state to the yeah. other. No, it's yeah. not. Totally right. different thing. Yeah. 
Yeah. Have, have these kinds of experiences uh, um, found their way into inspiration for compositions oh, for you? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Of course. <clears throat> I wrote a, a ballet uh, more than 10 years ago now that was commissioned by um, a company in Columbus, Ohio. And the ballet is called My Name is Jasmine, But They Call Me Jazz. Uh, and it was played for oh, about five or six times. Mm -hmm. The ballet was, uh, um, it had to stay in their uh, control for five uh -huh. years. And we have it now. We haven't been able to produce it because it's a big thing to produce yeah. a ballet. Yeah. But uh, we have it back now. And so, But I have recorded some of the songs. Mm -hmm. At that time, when I did it, I couldn't record any of the songs because <laughs> it belonged to them, you know. Yeah. And I've also written um, uh, for the Library of Congress a sonata called Quest Sonata that uses elements of uh, African-American music. Not necessarily jazz, but elements mm -hmm. of African-American music. But you would have to know that uh, because the, the interpretation of the player uh, makes a difference. If I play it, you'd definitely hear jazz. Oh, okay. But if someone else reads it and they play it, they would play it like a classic uh, player. <laughs> there you go, trying to, trying to get something on the page. That, yeah, you that, can't. <laughs> it's very hard to do, you know. Yeah. Which is why jazz itself was, a, you, you know, we were able to continue keeping it because people got it from the record. Mm -hmm not from the written page. Although, you know, you have jazz, uh, jazz bands, and they play jazz, and they read music, it's because of the, um, the band leader being able to instill the jazz inflection yeah. to that music, you know. Uh, but um, if you don't have the right people, you're not going to get that music. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. it takes a long time. Yeah. Let me just... Uh play something here to see if you... Did Perugia. Yeah. Sure. Nice chords. I like it. <laughs> was the uh, inspiration for this particular song? Was there one? Yeah, Perugia is a place almost in the center of Italy. Mm -hmm. And it's a, a, a city on the top of a hill, high on the top of a hill, where the Etruscans, uh, a group of people who escaped from slavery or enslavement uh, uh, in Africa and ran Oh my. to this area and, and, and stayed there and fought back the Romans and other people by throwing hot oil and rocks and everything else down. Finally, the Romans said, let, let them go, forget them, you know. And they, they, they won out. If you, read, if you read that history, it's, it's really interesting. Mm. And when I got there, knowing nothing about that, I watched these people every day at the top of this hill, on the top of the mountain, with, with this, these columns on these buildings and looking like Roman columns. I'm saying, you know, how did they get up here if they, these people build all this stuff, you know, by hand. Uh, and they walk from one end of the, the, uh, the, 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 the street to the other, and there's a certain time of day when all the shops close and people just walk promenade, and and the introduction that you hear is the mm. promenade, da -ba, ba, da -ya -ba. and it's just charging and walking back and forth, and here I am sitting there in amazement, looking at him. It's the most amazing thing to see, and then as I, as I, uh, I stayed there about I think it was a week or two, uh, with Thad Jones and Mel Lewis band. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, as I stayed there, I used to go for long walks and try to walk down the hill on the streets, you know. And you, you'd walk down a ways, and then the next thing you know, you're back up on another hill. <laughs> you know? You'd walk a while, and you'd go out this, this, down this road, and they would, they would curve around, and you'd be back. You know, you, there was one way to get down. 
you know, and you had to go that way uh -huh. to get down off the hill. But any any other time you wanted to get down, you would, and you might go down for a ways, but you'd have to end up back on top of the hill. Huh. So, <clears throat> so Perugia was, uh, but it was just so beautiful to me. I'd never seen anything like that, and that's where that melody came from. Mm -hmm. you know? um, but it it wasn't um, uh, an inspiration from Africa. It was more an inspiration from these very, very brown, light-skinned, but brown-skinned people, you know, with the combination of dark eyes and, and, and dark features and black hair. And not Sicilians, but close, you know? Yeah, wow. <laughs> you know, yeah, and, and uh, you know, I've, I've never, never gotten over Perugia. That's mm. really a very beautiful place, you know. I think if you go there now, you might see what I'm, what uh -huh. I'm talking about. Because that tradition still goes on. They still walk back and forth in a certain time of the day. Everything still closes up, oh. and they still walk back and forth like, like nomads, you know? Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, That's it's something fascinating. else. <laughs> hmm. uh, Thad Jones' Mel Lewis band was a, a nice career thing for you to do, it seems like. And you had some great moments on that, on record, too. When, <clears throat> when Thad left the Basie band, in 1962, uh, we were neighbors, living in the same town, and we were we had I had known Thad since the 40s, from Detroit, Pontiac days, you know. Uh, Thad lived in Pontiac. I lived in Detroit, and when he left the Basie Band, he um, got a gig at Columbia, at at um, CBS. His brother Hank was a pianist for Arthur Godfrey, and so Hank got it got Dad a job with the house band there. Yeah, and um, it it crushed Dad. He had to have a job, but that wasn't the kind of job he was. He was hoping that there would be something playing jazz, and occasionally, you know, Monk would call him. Uh, occasionally, he'd play with. Coleman Hawkins, or he'd play with this person around the town, but he wasn't happy, you know. And so uh, uh, I had a gig at at the uh, Five Spot. Yeah, Five Spot. And uh, I hired Dad. I used to have Coleman come and play with me, too, you know. I was friendly with all of them, and I would mm -hmm. invite them down, Kenny Burrell, anybody. And uh, so Dad came and played with me on a regular basis. He, basis. he came several times. And uh, one night, we were playing, and some Japanese people came in. And they were looking for a group to go to Japan to make a movie. And they came and heard the group, and they loved the group. And they went around and heard everybody else. And they came back and said, look, we'd like you to come to Japan to make this movie. So I asked Dad if he would go. And while we were there, now this is in 1960. I think it was, yeah, this was, while we were there, um, I talked that into getting his own band. And I said, look, all you need is a good bass player, a good drummer, and a good piano player. And I said, if you, you know, I, now I was the leader of that group, mm -hmm. but I said, I'll be your piano player if you want to make this band. And I don't know whether Thad believed me or what, I, be, I think he believed me because when he got back, he began to write, write more and more. And finally, sometime in 1965, he had been working off and on with Mel Lewis. And I think the idea that I gave him, mm -hmm. he passed it on to Mel Lewis, and then they decided to get the band. And I felt kind of uh, left out when he hired he, Hank, he, you know, because I had asked him right. about that first. But it turned out OK, you know, because I probably he talked to Hank more than, more than likely. I don't know for sure. But he probably talked to Hank and said, Hank, I hope you can make it. But if you can't, man, tell Roland to come on and play. You know? mm -hmm. That's probably why Hank told yeah. me to come. So it was a good move. Yeah. And it was a good move only because Thad wasn't, wasn't like Mingus or Sarah or Benny Goodman or anybody else. Thad was open to trying new new things. And oftentimes he would 
let me start out playing and wouldn't stop me until half the set was over. So I played the whole set and my chops developed, you know. Uh, Richard and Mel uh, behind me, we'd do all kinds of things. Mm. Avant in those days they called it avant-garde if you yeah. if you go out. <laughs> and we used to go out. Yeah, go out you know, and come, and come, back, come, come right back, back you know. <laughs> and we did stuff like Fingers and Once Around and, and uh, you know, a, a lot of things that were just really, you know, um, Every Monday night, at the end of the, the last set, on the, the last set, Dad would point to me and say, "Okay, you got it." And I would make up, you know, improvise on a tune. Basically, it was the same, same tune for a while, and I just make it up, you know. And then uh, one night, Dad came in with an arrangement on this tune. I said, "Dad, isn't that my tune?" <laughs> he said, "No, it's mine. I'm, it's mine. He wrote it out." <laughs> <laughs> It was just he in was the, the air. band leader. It was in the <laughs> air. You, know? you should have written it down. <laughs> well, see, that that that's one of those things that, that you know, there's no way you can ever redo that. Yeah. You know? Well, <laughs> Ellington did the same thing. I hear. You, oh yeah. You hear the guys playing the riffs. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. But I ne I never faulted him for that. You know, because yeah. he just he was just doing what band leaders did. You yeah. know. Yeah. yeah. If you. Throw an idea out there, he'd take it. <laughs> <laughs> Write it down. <laughs> mm. Mm. Well, you've done a lot of teaching over the years, and you still do. Mm. Do you teach um, jazz per se, or do you teach a lot of different courses? Uh, I teach two ensemble courses, and that is. Uh, undergraduate ensemble course. Now, there are um, all kinds of elective classes that the kids can take, but the ensemble classes are classes that give them a chance to learn about jazz. Mm -hmm. Most of them know the, don't know anything about jazz, but whatever they can do when they're undergraduate people, they're allowed to take this elective class. And when they come in, I don't know what instruments they're going to play. It could be clarinet, alto, tenor. It could be French horn. It could be violin player. It could be oboe player. Yeah. It could be flute player, anybody, you know. And if we have a bass player and a drummer and a piano player, what I do is I take the basic tunes that we all play, and I teach those tunes to them, and I, and I correct the wrong notes that are there, and I try to give them the proper inflection or phrasing. Uh, and then I try to explain to them how to play on the harmonies. Some of them come away grasping the, the idea. Uh, I have to demonstrate an awful lot. You know, I have to sit down at the piano and actually play. Uh, I, you, you just can't write out notes yeah. and say, do this. You have to, have to hands, it has to be hands on, you know. Um, and sometimes I'll take a uh, saxophone player in the rhythm section and play with them. Ask the other piano player to stand up and look, pay attention to what I'm doing. And then when they come back, they get a better sense of how to comp or, mm. or what, how to voice a chord or, you know, they listen to it. And then uh, um, after the class, I'm usually inundated with questions about because it takes a whole class for them to think of the yeah. kind of questions they want to ask. So I have to make myself available for them. And the teaching isn't just telling them, telling them to do something. It's doing it and having them watch or listen or, or play along or try. I, I have to go uh, from 10 to 10 sometimes, just to be with the students. You know, 10 o'clock in the morning wow. to 10 o'clock at night. Because if I, if I close my doors, well, then I lose the students. So I keep the doors open. So any one of them that have questions that want to ask, they come in and ask. Hmm. Then I have a, a graduate class that's uh, with students who already know how to play jazz. Uh, and I make them write 
See, they, they, the idea is the more they write, the more they search. The more they search, the better they get. You know, it's, it's like uh, if you work at something you really want, well, you can't help but increase your information, you know? Can't help it, you know? And it's, 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 it's my, um, it's the same, same way they taught me at Juilliard. Mm -hmm. You know, I had some excellent teachers. Uh, Gordon Stanley would, would give me pieces that I thought I'd never be able to play. And, you know, uh, I'd get to, like, say, after three weeks of playing, it still wasn't there. And he asked me to come out to his house. He lived in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania, and I'd come out to his house. And he had private students. And uh, I'd be up in the attic, in that hot attic, practicing on the dummy keyboard. Then when I'd come down and, and play for him, he would correct all the things I was doing. He'd say, now, slow it down. If you can play it slowly, you can play it fast. See, the, those, those things I never got from other teachers. Uh -huh. From him, he was my best teacher, I tell you. Well. He, he gave me information that nobody else would give, and now I'm just giving it back, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. And it, it works because I've, you know, I've been there, uh, this is almost the tenth year, uh -huh. and I have some people, Jesus, you wouldn't believe it. When you hear this, this young kid, Jeb Patton, you'll know what I mean. He's amazing. Wow. He plays everything. Plays everything. He plays from Bach to Bach. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I see your son has a yes mm -hmm. a, a thing out now. He's a singer. Very proud of him. Yeah. Um, because you know when he was young, um, I wanted him to play the piano. I said, Dad, I'm not. That's not for me. <laughs> you know. He told me point blank he was going to be an engineer. Uh. <laughs> But he never, never stopped singing. So now, you know, uh, he came back to me and he, he says, I want to sing, you know. I said, OK. Come to find out he's a good singer, you know. He had developed on his own, you know. Sometimes you, your kids have to go away and, uh -huh. you know, get their own thing, you know. I'll try to remember that. <laughs> and, I, you know, some people, they don't let their kids go, you know. Uh -huh. But uh, when he told me he, he wasn't going to be a piano player, I said, hey. You know, I can't, I'm not going to force you. Right. You know, and uh, he had to live his own life. I can't, yeah. can't live his life, life for him. But his, his singing is, uh, he's not operatic. Uh, and he doesn't sound like uh, Billy Eckstein. He has his own sound, and he's just naturally musical, mm -hmm. I guess, from being around. Uh, me in my musical uh, yeah. situation, but he's naturally musical, and it's, it's, when you hear the record, you you know what I mean, you know. Right. Uh, and what I did was I took uh, several of my students, one by one, and I infused them into the recording session, mm. so that I would have uh, professionals and wow. my son and the students as well. It's a great experience you know. for them. Yes, it is. Absolutely. And, one the guitarist, well, he's a wonderful guitarist, named Stan Young. Mm -hmm. Young fella. He really is young fella. He's 25, 26, something like that. You know? And uh, he was just, uh, when he heard the record, he, he couldn't believe how good it sounded. Oh. You, know? <laughs> you know? But uh, I'm still doing that, and I'm, I'm planning to do more. We have one coming out on Jeb Patton. Uh, we plan to do another one. Uh, we're, we've got one, I have, I have a young saxophonist by the name of Hideyeki uh, Aomori. Uh, he's the son of the young bass player that I have on this record now. We're putting out another one on him. Uh, and I plan to, to do some things that uh, won't include me, just the students or just the new people. But uh, on these first four, it's been me with everybody else, you know, and me with Michael. You know, Michael is right. Michael Hanna at home with friends. Uh huh. You know? mm -hmm. Well, this has been a great conversation. Well, thank you. You know, I just I, I have to say, listening to one particular solo you played today, that you really have a what I consider to be a composer's sense of in your improvising. Mm. You know, that there's a great use of. Uh, 
mixture of courting, you know, rhythmic things, and you did something just in octaves. Oh. You know, <laughs> one octave delayed off the yeah. other, and mm -hmm. I mean, it's a yeah. great device. And it I, just I try well. to, to use uh, uh, material that uh, sort of either, I can't say needs development, but I, but develops itself. I try to let the music develop itself. That's what I try to do. Uh, when I make a conscious effort, effort at it, it doesn't work. Uh -huh. But when I make a feeling effort, in other words, when I let the music flow out, then it works. You know, and whatever I have to do to, to get it out, uh, it's, it, it's not so much that I'm forcing the physical part. The physical part happens, you know. Like sometimes, you know, I, I can hear uh, repeated notes. Well, fortunately for me, I had teachers who taught me how to play repeated notes. Because otherwise, I'd be trying to do it with my wrist, and you can't do that. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know? Yeah, right. But uh, they showed me how you do it with your fingers. And yeah. You just do it. And so now I've practiced enough so that it's natural. Right. And those, those things come out not because they're technical, but because it's part of the way I hear now, you know. Uh, I was talking to Brunius a while ago about Alvin Batiste. And Alvin Batiste is one of those kind of people who hears a certain way. And having studied his clarinet so much, he does things very naturally, you know. Uh, I don't know whether you know him. If you do know him, you might know what I mean. When he plays, he plays in an angular kind of pattern that goes, that shifts back and forth before you know it. And he's playing on regular harmonies, but it's very unusual sounding. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what happens sometimes when I play it. Uh, it, it. It develops, but I never know how it's going to <laughs> yeah. develop, you know? <laughs> never know. Right. <laughs> it just happens on its own. Well, thanks for thinking of well, that. Well, somebody uh, called it the jazz was the music of surprise, so mm. I guess that's where <laughs> mostly good surprises. Well, yeah. anyway. Well, keep it up. It was, oh. Talked a long time. <laughs> I didn't realize. <laughs> well, it was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. <laughs>